Good morning. <laughs> now that business is over, let's get to the Word of God. This morning, we have a couple with us who have been married for 65 years. We applaud this milestone because it is so rare in our days. A man meets a woman, and he convinces her that her life would be far better if she would leave the comforts of her home with her parents, having everything paid for, and track off somewhere where nobody knows where they're going to spend time with him and him alone. Somehow, women every day are convinced of that. We thank God for that, don't we, men? <laughs> if you were to take a look at this and say, but that does not really balance out on a ledger. There may be even times in, in, in thought of exasperation where we say, what was I thinking? Perhaps some of you are even thinking that right now. Statistics on divorce reflect a constant failure of almost one, almost one out of two marriages fail in the last decade. Research from the National Fathers Initiative in 2005 have identified eight of the most common reasons people get divorced. And I must say that as I, before I read this article, I thought I knew the number one reason. And I was in error. I had maybe two of them out of the reasons. The first one, with the highest percentage of all couples who took this, took this, uh, um, I don't want to say a test, but reasons that they gave for a divorce, 73% of them said lack of commitment. The second, too much arguing. 56% said there was too much arguing. The third, infidelity. The fourth, they married too young. The fifth, unrealistic expectations. The sixth, lack of equality. The seventh, lack of preparation. And the eighth, abuse. How can the Bible offer any help to the modern marriage? I put to you that within this book, within this Bible, is the secret of marriage. You and I perhaps might think that where would we begin then to find the secret? Perhaps we should go to the book of Genesis. Because after all, that is when marriage began. We find the very first couple, Adam and Eve, working together in the Garden of Eden. That would be a great place to begin. But the beginning does not tell us the secret of marriage. Perhaps you're thinking, what about the New Testament? The book of Ephesians has a wonderful picture of marriage. That too is a great passage for us to go to. But in that passage, we are just given a slight hint to the secret of marriage. Well, where in the Bible would we go to find the secret of marriage? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 2 is our passage. Ephesians chapter 2, we find and discover the secret of marriage. Paul said in chapter 2, verse 5. Paul said in chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Did I just tell you the wrong book? Yes. My wife's giving me this look that we're not related. We're... Did I say Ephesians? Okay, thank you. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the secret. The secret of marriage, of having the mind of Christ. Or to put it another way, servanthood. Mankind, by his very nature, does not have a servant's heart. He is selfish, self-centered, prideful. 
His nature tends to bring isolation instead of unity. And even as Christians, we struggle with this. We struggle with this nature. We do not have the mind of Christ. Yet, we need the mind of Christ in order to live correctly and to bring honor to God. Therefore, Paul challenges the Christians, the servants of God, to have the same mindset of Christ. And there is a progression of servanthood shown by our outline today. It begins with the challenge. There is a challenge to servanthood. Second, there is a description of servanthood. And lastly, there is a result of servanthood. My kids love going to grandma and grandpa's. Perhaps your grandkids love coming to your house too. Grandparents have the unique ability of making what's common, uncommon. We were just in Weaverville, and at, at breakfast time, grandma always seems to make breakfast, pancakes, or something that the kids want. But this time it was pancakes. And as I watched the pancakes being made, and who wants pancakes, and we want pancakes, and we, oh, can we have this on it? Oh, yes. And can we have this? And can we have a, a pound of syrup to go with two pieces of bacon? Oh, yes, of course, and, and all these wonderful things. And I thought, we have the exact same thing at home. But why is it that when we have pancakes at our house, they're just pancakes? But at Grandma's house, they're Pancakes! And as I sat and I watched what took place, I realized, huh, I get it. When everybody's all done eating at Grandma's house, Grandma cleans up. At our house, the kids start cleaning up. So pancakes aren't so wonderful because there's work that's got to be done. Servanthood does not come naturally. That's why we need to be challenged and the challenge of servanthood, our first point, is directed to the mind. Notice back in chapter 2, verse 5, Paul said, i got to get there too. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Different translations express the imperative used in verse 5 for the Greek word to think, thinking. Some say, have this attitude, have this mind, let this mind or this way of thinking. The message translates it this way, and I think they kind of capture the idea. Think of yourself the way Christ thought of himself. There's a comparison there, and we have to ask ourselves, well, how did Christ think of himself? As the ultimate service, servant, always giving. For others. This small word directs our attention back. Let this mind be in you. Well, what is this mind? Back in verses 1 through 4, Paul talks about the unity, the self sacrifice, self denying, the self giving, the bottom line, the humble attitude that is derived and found in verses 1 through 4. That is the thought of a servant. Always thinking of others and what he can do for someone else, not what can I get from them. Christ's entire, entire ministry was not, well, I can't wait till I arrive because the entire world's going to praise my name. It didn't come that way. He came, I can't wait to get here so I can serve every person that's sitting at a table. That I, the creator of the universe, can serve you. During one of Moody's Bible conferences in the 1800s, a group of European pastors had come to speak. And as was their custom, they would place their shoes, have walking around all day before paved streets and so forth, they would take their muddy shoes and set them outside in the hallway. And in the European custom, a hall servant would come through, pick up the shoes, clean them, and polish them. When Moody was walking through, he noticed all the shoes that were sitting outside the hallway. But he didn't want his friends to be embarrassed. He gathered up all the shoes, 
and he brought them into his room. And he began to polish and clean them. And then he set them back outside the door for the next day so nobody would know that he took it upon himself and cleaned them. You say, well, how did anybody find out? Well, in the middle, while Moody was in the room cleaning all these shoes, can you imagine, just shoes everywhere, and he's in there scrubbing away after the conference, everyone's tired, one of Moody's friends walked in and saw him doing that. So what are you doing? I'm cleaning everybody's shoes. I don't want them to be embarrassed to walk around in dirty shoes. This is America. We clean our own shoes. Their custom is to have somebody else do that. Well, couldn't you find somebody else to do it? Yeah, I asked. But everyone had excuses for why they couldn't do it. Well, Moody didn't tell anybody. But you can believe his friend told others. God uses men and women who have servant hearts, who say, here I am, use me. Not only is our challenge, the challenge directed towards the mind, but the challenge is also exemplified by a person. No other person completely and consistently demonstrates these characteristics of servanthood more than Jesus Christ. His entire purpose for coming to earth was just to serve you and I. Christ said, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of he who sent me. If you are to do the will of your spouse, you must first know it. What does he or she want? You might ask yourself, what does my spouse really want of me? The one thing that all committed people share is time. Remember the first reason for divorce was lack of commitment? But committed people share time together. There's not a distinction between quality and quantity. It's just time has to be there. Let me just use a, a musical illustration for, th for this. In order to become, in order to make beautiful music, we must spend time with the instrument. In order to make beautiful music with your wife or your husband, you must spend time with them. Does it come quickly? No. But neither does the skill of playing the piano. We are committed to it. Hence, we invest time. And the more time we put into it, the better it sounds. Now, I know you enjoy listening to Lori play the piano. But I bet you would not have enjoyed her hearing her when she was this high playing the piano. A lot of complunking, a lot of, can we move the piano in another room? But commitment is heard in the sound. The fact that Christ is our challenge of servanthood may imply that Surely, servanthood is not that difficult after all. Because if Christ could do it, how hard can it be for anybody else to do it? But yet we find servanthood extremely difficult. We find servanthood almost impossible. And on a daily measure, daily measure, measure if we are asked to serve, we recoil almost immediately. But in Philippians 2, 5 through 11 we have one of the greatest Christological passages in the entire New Testament. And it, Paul is putting this to the Philippians for a specific purpose. Because if he is the servant, you and I should serve. If his greatness is so great and he bowed the knee to serve, then why can't we, who are not that great, be willing to serve? Paul does not try to explain all the things that he knows about Christ. But as Barclay says, his aim was to persuade the Philippians to live a life which, in which disunity, discord, and personal ambition had no place. This is easy to say in light of, in light of how easy words flow from our mouth. But it is a hard task to try to obtain 
when a prideful attitude is a constant of the American attitude. But we're not alone. You see, the Philippians had the same thing. That Greek attitude was apparent because the Greeks had a lot to boast about. They were the, the intellectuals of society. Philosophic, philosophically, philosophical, there was no one that could match them. In science, in knowledge, in culture, in art, no one could compare. In fact, Rome looked at the Greek culture and said, wow, we love it. We want to copy it. So Rome would build everything up, just like the Greeks, but they would only cover the outside of it with the marble. They would not take all the time and effort and commitment that was required to build marble pillars. They would take brick and put it on the outside, and then afterwards they would overlay it all. So it gave the appearance of that same culture. The Greeks had the idea that servanthood was not a characteristic to be admired. It was not something to raise up. Servanthood was just a common characteristic of a slave. And slaves had no rights. They had no position. So Paul lays out for them, what is the description of true servanthood? What does it look like? There's three things I just want to point out to you about servanthood. First, servanthood is not a loss of personhood. Servanthood is not a loss of personhood. Christ, being in the form of God in verse 6, or the nature of God, speaks to his preexistence. When Christ became a servant, he did not lose who he was. Therefore, since he did not lose who he was, he did not think it or consider the manner of equality with God as something to be achieved. Because he was always and he, he was always God. He did not step down from being God. He was God already. He enjoyed the person of being deity. He enjoyed all those things that deity prescribed to him. He had them. So he did not think that becoming God was something that he needed to grasp because he was already God. He doesn't lose who he is. The second thing on servanthood. Servanthood postpones honor. Servanthood postpones honor. Servanthood does not look for the immediate gratification. In verse 7, we need to take a little short theological break for a moment. Verse 7 says, He made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and becoming the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of men. Verse 7 in the theological realms is known as the kenosis passage. The word means to make void, no effect, to be vain, for it to be vain or empty. Though different trans, through different translations, we get different meanings or ideas that come from this. But the following idea of emptied himself is what typically we find in a lot of passages. He made himself of nothing. He gave up his divine privileges. He set aside those privileges. And theolo theologians have struggled with this idea that how can God empty himself of anything? How can God take some of his attributes or his characteristics and just say, eh, I'll set that aside. Can God take his love and put that on the back burner and no longer be loving or being eternal or all-knowing or all-powerful? And that's the problem that theologians have ran into. How does this fit? What did Christ do and it has led many to believe that somehow he had to become less of something in order to take on humanity. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is trying to point out. There are no removals of his attributes. Because by doing so, he would stop being God. And as soon as Christ stopped being God, we would have no purpose of even meeting here today. Because our salvation would not be secure. Because he would not qualify 
to be the savior of the world. He would not be sufficient to die on the cross. He would not have the power to to raise himself from the dead or to give up his life if he was not God. Paul does not say that he emptied himself. In fact, what Paul's trying to communicate and explain is how he divested himself or using the words metaphorically, how he poured himself out. Christ put himself in complete service of the people. But he made himself of no reputation is what the New King James says, but he divested himself. How? By taking the form of a bondservant. How? By coming in the likeness of men. How? By being found in the appearance of man. By this we know that he loved us because he laid down his life for us. Another passage tells us he became poor so we could become rich. There are three ways that Christ did this. And he lays them out. By taking on the form of a slave. This was not a position, but this was his new nature that he took on. He added, if you will, to to what he was already doing. Christ took on the servant, the slave's position. He didn't come and say, all right, this is my new role. I'm going to act and be a slave. During vacation Bible school, I became spy guy. And I talked with a funny accent. But I was still Sean Hall. That was just something that I did. Christ did not come and say, I am going to just be a servant for a short period of time. He was the servant. And as a servant, he had no rights. No rights even to his own life. He had no privileges that he could point to and say, Ah, I demand such and such because I... No. Verse 7 says, By taking the form of a slave, he lowered himself. A slave comes to the master and says, What can I do for you? How can I serve you? That's what Christ did. How can Christ serve you and me? The second thing that he did, by coming in the likeness of man, Christ was really like mankind. He had a human nature. He had a physical body. He had mental capacity. He had social skills. He had spiritual growth. He had all these things. He can sympathize with our weakness And was in all points tempted, just as you are, just as I am. Christ had his feelings hurt. Christ was mocked. He felt those those arrows penetrate him. But Christ was also different. He was like man, but he was different. He was sinless. And he was God. The third thing. By coming in the appearance of man. As a man, he could touch the hurting. He could hold the broken. He could rejoice with the happy. He could celebrate a wedding or an anniversary. Christ could come along and touch and feel and care for. You remember when when Christ came and all the children were coming up to him? And he said, suffer not the little children to come under me. In other words, stop keeping the kids away from me. What do kids do when there's someone they want to be around? They are constantly grabbing and clinging and want to be picked up and held. So most likely the kids were climbing all over Jesus. And you can just imagine in your mind the disciples saying, get away from him, get away from him, he's busy, get away from him, get away. And the funniest thing is, whose kids do you think those, those kids were? Street urchins? No. Probably the disciples' kids. As they, as they moved with him and did everything. How would these kids be so close to the Lord if they probably weren't part of that family anyway? Do not stop them from coming. I want to hold and touch, and I want them to be able to touch me. By being found in the appearance of man, Jesus was real, approachable, 
When the crowds pressed him, he looked out into the harvest, said, let's pray for workers because the need is so great. I can't even do it all myself. Servanthood is humbling. In the last in verse 8, he says, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Notice that Christ was not humbled. Someone did not come in and humble him. He humbled himself. He didn't rely on what someone was going to do to them. He took it up on his, on his own. And the idea of being humbled means to be brought low. Think of a Sacramento River or the Nile or any river that you grew up with at home. In different seasons, the rivers would come, become low. Christ, all on his own, brought himself low. The cross was the most humiliating forms of death. It was only preserved for criminals, for the worst of criminals, for the murder, for the thief. The cross was so bad that it was not even used on Roman citizens. Hence, the Apostle Paul was not crucified, but beheaded. But Christ was not a citizen of Rome. Even to the Hebrew, being hung on a tree was a sign that you were cursed. And yet Christ humbled himself, went low and said, that's where I'm going, even to the point of death, the death of a cross. There's no definite article in there for you Bible students. It's just a cross. The idea that he is humbling himself and he's moving forward. The cross did not deter him. He walked forward and embraced it. Now why would he embrace such a thing? Why would this servant embrace the cross? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. Because the servant has come to serve. He has come to serve you and I in a way in which will bring us into a relationship with the Lord God. The third point. There are results of servanthood. The results of servanthood are three, and for time's sake, I'm only going to point out the three. First, there's a promotion. One of the results that we see here out of servanthood, there is a promotion. In verse 9, therefore God will, has also highly exalted him. That's a promotion. Took him from the servanthood and exalted him and brought him up above every other person in heaven, on earth, or below earth. Christ had received the most ultimate promotion that you can receive. Psalm chapter 2 tells us that he is to be ruler over all things and will rule with a rod of iron. You and I oftentimes are anxious to be promoted. We cannot wait to be promoted, to get the next step, because along with that might come more responsibility, it might come a pay raise, it might be better benefits, but with promotion comes responsibility. God exalted Christ, the one who could handle the responsibility, and promoted him. Sometimes we need God to promote us in our own relationships, to move us up to do what we can't do in, a, in and of ourselves. There was a married couple that I knew that I thought had the perfect marriage. They came to church every Sunday, Wednesday night, Sunday night. And when the Bible was open, their Bible was open. And when it came time for theological questions, their hands were raised. And, they were, and if they didn't agree, they said, we'll go home and we'll read about that and see if that's right. And one time we had the privilege of going and meeting with him and talking. And after he passed away, she told us that early on in their marriage, she looked for a way to divorce him. She said, I went through the front part of the Bible to the back part of the, part of the Bible. I was looking for just a cause, a reason, anything I could find scripturally to divorce this man. She said, he was so hard, so hard to live with. 
He wasn't caring. He didn't communicate. When he came home from work, how was your day? He didn't talk about it. She said, it was just so difficult. And she said, I didn't understand until he died. That was 60-some years later. You see, Bill had worked for the government in a secret branch, developing secret weapons. And he received all kinds of awards and promotions and things like that, but he couldn't even tell his own wife about them. That caused a riff in their relationship. So she poured her heart out to God, said, God, I can't love him. Can you, you are going to have to love him through me. And you know what? God did. And she did. And hence, when I met them, I thought they were the most happy married people ever. He opened the door for her. She got in the car and he closed it. God changed. God promoted. God gave a different position. Along with that, God gives a title. The results of this servanthood is a title. And the title is a new name. It says, therefore, he has highly exalted him and given him a name, the name which is above every name. Oftentimes, we have created new names for positions to help people out. I can't give you a raise, but we're going to now call you the executive chief of, of all flooring or something like that, or the executive chief of, we're going to give you a title. And the title that Christ get is a name that no other person has. It is not shared by anybody. It is the Lord God. I don't even know what it is. Perhaps it's the name that's written on his thigh. It's a name that only he knows. And then thirdly, honor. Verse 10. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Those in heaven and those on earth and those under earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of God the Father. The entire universe will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They will confess. That doesn't mean what we typically think, that, oh, I didn't tell you before, but I need to tell you now. Confess means to say the same thing, to agree with, to publicly declare. And that's what they're going to do. This is the Lord God, and we are going to say, yes, that is the Lord God, our God, our Savior. And so is everybody else. The secret of marriage is the same secret in every relationship. It is the same secret that we need to apply in our own life. It's the secret that Gene and Clayton have used. They have taken the challenge to have this mindset, this way of thinking that Christ had. They've seen the description of servanthood. And there's a result. You probably do not have to be around Clayton and Jean very long before you can visually see the result of servanthood. How they care for one another. In their conversations, how they communicate the love that's there. How they elevate one another. They honor one another. You and I are challenged with having that mindset. The mindset that says, what would Christ do and what did Christ do? Hard? Yeah. There's nothing easy about this. But hence, that's why Paul tells the Philippians, you have a lot to brag about. You have a lot to boast about. But doesn't Christ have even more? He came and humbled himself for you and me. He did all this for us. Cannot we do the same thing? Cannot you and I say, I need the mindset of Christ today as I sit around and enjoy one another's company, as I drive home, as I go to work, and as I interact with my kids I need that mindset. Seeking someone else's best first. 
Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? There are some things in God's word that are just hard to apply. And I know this is one of them. It is difficult for myself when I come to this passage and say, think the way Christ thought about himself and then put it into action. Even in my own marriage, having the mindset is a moment by moment, minute by minute, second by second, mindset that I am constantly grasping for. It seems like there are so many things in our life that will easily distract us and pull us and say, ah, but I, I just need a moment for myself. Lord, the only time that we see you removing yourself from people, from the disciples, is time alone with your Father. Outside of that, you are surrounded by people all the time. Perhaps, Lord, there are some here that are struggling with this mindset. And Lord, may we just surrender that to you today. Surrender our hearts and our attitude that we might rejoice in the description that we see and recognize that there will be a reward. There is a result of this. Help us to change our attitude. We are not being walked on, but we are serving you. And we are doing exactly what our Savior has done. We ask that you bless our time together as we go forward and, and we continue to celebrate 65 years of serving one another. May that be the legacy that each of us strive for. You are first. So that we might lift others up. In Jesus' name, amen.